Jason Cox, how are we, mate? Mate, awesome. Thanks for having me back. It's good to be here. No worries, mate. So what's it been up what's been up to for you lately? So obviously the socials have been blowing up and a lot of more business opportunities for high performance cricket. How's it been going? Mate, it's been really good. I think when I'm, we talked last um, time, high performance cricket was pretty small on the socials and I think probably only had a couple hundred followers. Mm-hmm. But um no, nah, it's grown grown quite quite nice. I think we're sitting around eleven and a half thousand now. So uh, yeah, it's really exciting, really good and yeah, just over the last couple of years just been Oh, probably over the last year or so, it's just been developing nicely, getting more athletes uh, on board, helping um, expanding the, the business and expanding more coaching sessions, um, doing a lot more sprint work, um, even more gym stuff. And, and yeah, and in, in the footy side of it as well, still working at Box Hill and um, start up a role doing the high performance at Halebury with the, uh, the first 11 there at school. So um, pretty busy work was a footy and cricket, but... But it's awesome, but loving it. You managing to get a few games in down at Kui, I see. Hundred percent back at Kui. Um, How's the body holding up down there? Fine. Well, he's holding up good. I'm actually training for a half marathon right now. Okay, yep. So I'm pretty like running fit. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I play footy, I don't really get too much contact as either like stay on the outside. So yep. No, no bruises for me. What position are we playing down there? Uh, playing centre forward tomorrow. Okay, yep. So looking forward to that. Playing Phillip Island. Um, home or away? At home, thankfully. Yep. So hopefully, hopefully get a couple of kicks in the scoreboard. It'd be nice. And you mentioned running just then. Obviously, cricket and footy are probably two different with the running standards. But how important is running still to cricket? Oh, running is is paramount. I feel like with cricket, uh, sprinting is probably the most important thing to to learn. Like sprinting is a skill, mm-hmm. um, and it's something that I teach a lot with athletes I work with. So I run like specific speed sessions for my athletes. So I teach them how to sprint properly and run faster, run more efficiently. Think of like all the the main plays in cricket, like running into bowl, obviously going to be enhanced by um, learning how to run better, running between wickets. Like if you can pick up some more runs, um, get more singles, more twos, obviously it's going to help you um, perform better and make more runs if you can run faster. Being better in the field, chasing after the balls, being more dynamic athlete in the field, going to be enhanced by sprinting. So... All that stuff is so super important. Um, and then that's all underpinned by being just fit enough um, mm-hmm. and having a good base and not being um, yeah, unfit. We can only do that for a session. You want to be able to do that for multiple sessions and um, hopefully if you get to a standard where you go to that multiple days in a row. Um, mm-hmm. So you still got to be pretty fit. Yeah, and how, would you, how do you go about when you're doing your clients the split from, say, strength work to running? Yeah, so how I got it in my... like my actual coaching sessions right now. We do gym Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then on Saturdays, we do our speed work. Um, I'll probably give them another speed session or a running session to do external to that. So about that two to three runs per week and that two to three gyms per week seems to be a pretty good balance between the both. And what what um, specific like split are you training when you go into gym? Is it an upper or lower type of stuff, or what? How are we looking at in gym scenarios? Yeah, for three sessions a week, typically it would be three full body sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, for guys who have different um, goals or have different schedules, I can do an, an upper lower um, for some guys. So some guys like to train in the gym like five days a week or four days a week, and those are the guys um, who I work with a lot online, and they will do like an upper lower split. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll do the running on the same day as the low as the lower body weights. Yep. To try and keep those loads, um, those on legs loads on the same day. So then the next day they have complete rest on their legs. Whereas if you do legs every single day, um, sometimes it can be quite fatiguing. And we're trying to maximise days off to facilitate that recovery. Yeah. Um. So then you also just mentioned um online. How have you found the transition from setting up your online business to not doing it necessarily face to face? Has it How's that been, um, the process? has been challenging or have you enjoyed the journey so far of d- doing online as well as face-to-face? Yeah, I really enjoy it. Um, just gives you access to help more people from around the world. Um, I'm really lucky. I, I actually get to help. I'm coaching people from um, America, from from the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, Would this India. be all ba- mainly cricket-based um, training though? Yeah. Yeah, all cricket stuff. All cricket stuff. Um, so pretty cool to say like I'm, I'm working with God internationally and – yeah, I love it. I probably first started just by like giving like programs out to people, like giving programs away to people and helping that out initially, which is like I suppose purely online. That would be back in two thousand twenty-two. Yep. And then that transition to me thought, oh, I may as well do this in person. 
And then while that through the social media and that the online stuff's been really um, taking off and it's great because it gives people time to a chance to to live yeah, far away from me mm-hmm. and still and still train and still get the best programming that they possibly can rather than doing it themselves. And with that online stuff, I incorporate a lot of like other lifestyle coaching and things like that, like stuff with their nutrition and like their mental skills and then like their performance psychology side of it. Um, like talk cricket and tactics and, and things like that. So we try and incorporate like the holistic sort of performance um, rather than just the gym and running side of it, um, which is great as well. We can do that through like phone or video calls, um, sending voice memos um, and things like that as well. It's just to try and educate um, the athletes on to live better lives and be better people. Do you think as much as a bad time as it was, do you think COVID's helped that online like coaching uh, type of environment and workload? 100%. I think I would never even heard of like a, a video call before COVID. And then like it got Zoom, you got Google Meet, you got Teams, all that sort of thing. So I think that's um, made it more normal for people to um, yeah communicate that way um, and not rely on that face to face. And you're right, I think everyone's more conditioned now to that. So I think that really forced people to pivot and uh, find ways to um, influence others and help other people from not just their own backyard and helps help people get more reach and help more people, which is the main thing. Now we're gonna we're gonna touch on a lot of topics here, but um, recovery. How key is recovery? And are you an ice bath person? I know there's a lot of people that love it, and there's some people that are just like it's not as important as some people say. What's your thoughts on the recovery, and in particular, ice baths? Hundred percent. So recovery is like so important, and with recovery, I think the number one thing for recovery is just having a well balanced um, training workload. So. There, it becomes a point where you train too much that you can't recover from. And it's all based on your training load and your week of training should be based on like what you're trying to get out of it. So for example, it wouldn't be a great idea to do your heaviest gym session and your heaviest like net session or, or footy session a day before a game because that's going to be hard to recover from to play a game of footy the next day. But if we have that on a Wednesday or a Thursday, that's a lot better for recovery to so be able to get up for a game Saturday. So just balancing your week, number one, is really, really important. Just make sure you're doing the right things at the right times. Um, otherwise, yeah, because with recovery, you, there is an element of time and rest that is required. The big the big rocks for recovery, though, is sleep. Mm-hmm. Like, you can't... You know, that be eight, eight hours, you're saying? Eight, eight hours. Eight hours for adults. Um, nine, ten hours for teenagers. Mm-hmm. And it's like, there's a saying that goes like, you can't out ice bath a bad sleep. Like Mm -hmm. you can have all the ice baths in the world, but if you had a bad sleep, your recovery is still going to be impaired. So you've got to prioritize your sleep. Um, Things that help with your sleep is reducing your caffeine um, like after midday. So if you have like a cup of coffee or 80 milligrams of coffee, which is a shot, eight hours later, half that still circulating in your system. So it'd be like having half half a shot of coffee at, 8, 8 p.m. at night. So just keeping those things in mind, um, being exposed to darkness and being in a dark room, trying to minimize phone time and screen time, which is so hard. And to be honest, I'm pretty bad at myself. But <laughs> things I've tried to do is like listen to a podcast before bed, maybe like the Up the Guts podcast where you <laughs> chuck it on before you go to bed. Um, and just lie like 15 minutes just so you don't have that light in your eyes. It helps you fall asleep a bit better. Um, or like reading a book or something before you go to bed. And then... That, that's the best for sleep hygiene. Um, that's the most important form of recovery. And then moving on from that, another big rocky. But just before we move on to that, sorry, um, have you tried any of the tapes, the the mouth or nose, or have you seen that around? Have you tried any of them or heard anything about them, how they work? Yeah, I've, I actually have my, um, I when I first started up high performance career, I had a, like a business coach, a business mentor, and he actually just released his own brand, Um for nasal strips, and I think it actually has tremendous benefits. Um, from all reports, it like really helps open up that nasal cavity, and you get like higher quality oxygen in. So apparently, it's actually really, really good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then you're saying past the sleep, next the next um, key pillar to that was yeah. So apart from sleep, I think the next and most important thing for that is managing just your life stress. So just if you're wound up tight, stressed, you're not going to be able to recover as well. So just finding time to have downtime and relax. Mm-hmm. Um, 
nutrition and hydration from then is another big rock. So make sure we're refueling with carbohydrates, high protein um, to replenish the stores that we lost. And then with hot rehydration as well is to try and um, yeah get a lot of fluids back in and then electrolytes as well. If we're doing... If we're covering those big rocks of sleep, um, nutrition, hydration, and stress management, then we can move on to um, our active mod- modalities. So there's nothing like mobility and then going for a walk. Mm-hmm. That's probably the next best thing there. So actually getting moving again is great. Like everyone that understands that feeling when they've just sat around day and they feel so stiff and it feels shocking. Whereas getting up, going for a walk, getting some sunlight, exposure, um, doing a stretch, you always feel a million bucks after that. And it's pretty cruisy. You can chuck TV on and have a stretch in front of the TV. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, we do get into like your ice baths, your, like your normal tech boots, your, your hot and colds, um, like your saunas, your um, all those sort of modalities, um, which are the smaller rocks. So they can... And how much time are you spending in, say, the hot and cold? Oh, it... It doesn't honestly matter too much. Maybe like one minute at a time, one minute on, one minute off, two minutes on, two minutes off, three minutes on, three minutes off. About that one to one works. It's as I said, it's not as important. The like it doesn't actually matter. I think like two minutes isn't better than like three minutes, etc. Um, I'd do like a fifteen minute session or something like that. So if it's one on one off or two on two off, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, that stuff, I like anecdotally like it does help make you feel better. 100. I, I think it makes you feel better. There's no science behind it though. Yep. That really says it does. But I personally think you feel better after a nice bath. And feeling good is, like with recovery, you want to get back to feeling good. Um, so I'm, I'm all for it. If you, people want to do it, 100%. But at the same time, if people get stressed thinking about that, if they hate it that much and they get so stressed thinking about it, that will, that will affect our big rock of managing your stress. So I, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. But if you want to do it, do it, is how, what I say. How do you get in the headspace to do it? Because I know a lot of people say who do it, you've got to, you're thinking it's worse than it is and you've got to be controlling your breathing while you're in there. What are some strategies that maybe you did or you teach people to do when going into that talk, sort of recovery? Yeah, I feel like it has to be, first of all, I feel like the person has to want, want to do it. Mm-hmm. Um I'm not big on forcing people to do things because yeah. um, people ju- will just want to do things that they want to do. And if you're forcing somebody to do some, something... They'll fall off eventually. 100%. Unsustainable. So I think all that stuff, it's all in, that's where the individualization comes into it, where they can just do whatever they feel like they want to do. Um, but for me personally, oh, I'm not the biggest... Like, I don't know. Like, oh, sometimes I feel like doing it. Sometimes I don't. Um, like for my own training and that. Mm-hmm. But when, when I'm like, nah, let's just do it. I think it's just nothing just like you, you You just have to go do it. Like you can have these all these techniques like slowing down your breathing is really good and things like that. But sometimes when things go, just go get done, you just go get in there. And it's one of those things, it's like this delayed gratification. Like it will feel pretty bad when you're in there. Mm-hmm. And afterwards though is when you get the, the benefits. So think about like maybe why you're doing it or think about the, the, future, the future you and just try and make your life better in the future um, by just delaying that gratification a little bit. Yeah, so say if we you're going to play footy or you've just finished a career game, how soon should this recovery be starting? Should you think about, all right, let's start my recovery routine? 100%. So this is a really – so game finishes, you go in there. Um, I do a situation, you go in there, win, sing a song. From there straight away, we're getting fluids back in. We're drinking plenty of water, um, hydrolytes, if they're per- Gatorades, get that in here straight away. We're then – Try and get some high quality foods back into us as possible. So get plenty of carbs, plenty of protein, eating that straight away. Um, from there, it's sort of pick your poison. Do you want to have a bit of a stretch, a bit of foam rolling, um, et cetera? And then you can jump into your hot and colds. You can eat that straight away if you have that available at the at your club or whatever. So oftentimes, if it's local, maybe you won't. Mm-hmm. So I'll be having, um, yeah, just having a shower. Going home, re- relaxing. As I said, like relaxing and just actually de-stressing is probably the best the best thing to do. So go home, relax, and if you can get in, get nice baths at home, either that next day um, or that night. Yep, that that's absolutely awesome. Does, doesn't matter which if it's the next that night or the next day. Nah, it doesn't it doesn't matter at all really. Um, the next day I'll be trying to go out, going for a walk, 
having a stretch. All those things are really basic and really easy, and that's how I think it's the best way of making it consistent. Like just do things that are pretty, that are, are low friction. So if you live near the beach, walk down to the beach, get in there 15 minutes, 20 minutes, um, jump out, um, go for a stretch while you're watching TV in the morning, maybe watching the Sunday flu show, have a stretch or watching that. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, the worst thing for recovery is is getting on the piss. It's alcohol. Yeah. So that is like a hand. Which is hard to avoid sometimes, especially in the local sporting stuff. 100%. Typically, what I've, from my ideal recovery, um, I mentioned before about the hydrolytes and the food, typically the first thing you'll get if you're playing seniors or twos footy is a, um, a slab in the middle. Mm-hmm. So alcohol is like, when it goes back to nutrition, hydration, one of big rocks, that is the worst possible thing you can do for your recovery because it stuffs up your sleep and it's poor nutrition, hydration, and it's a like it's it's a depressant. So it also makes you more stressed and you get the anxiety in the next day and things like that. So it's actually the recipe for the worst thing for recovery. Mm-hmm. However, though, we aren't robots and um, you are going to want to enjoy some social time with your mates. But maybe it's just not. Maybe it's before you get on the beers. Maybe it's having a couple of hydrolytes and yeah. making sure you. You Balance tick, it out. Hundred percent. You tick those boxes. You have a good meal. You don't wait till the HSP later on at night. You eat a good feed. Um, you hydrate well. You have a couple of hydrolytes, and then and then you can go and have a few beers. Maybe you don't get absolutely plastered. Maybe you just have like six, six or seven, and then you still have a bit of a buzz, and you feel, still feel good, and you're not blacked out somewhere. Um, yeah. And you're not and try not to get home at four a.m. or something like that, and try, try and get home a bit earlier than normal because of what, um, not not too much. Good happens after after midnight. Exactly. Now on the you mentioned getting some good food in. Obviously, I heard um, recently. Well, I kind of knew it, but some people don't understand the importance of diet, especially before or after doing activity. So let's take gym for example. People think going to the gym is gonna make you put on muscle, but then what I heard was when you're going to the gym, you're actually tearing it, and then you need to go back in. Um, after it, go back, fuel up with your protein to heal it back up pretty much. So what would a day-to-day be like for you? Say you're you're going for a run and then you're doing a gym session afterwards. What are you having prior and what are you having post? Yeah, And is, it, is that right? Is it you're tearing it in the gym pretty much? Yeah, 100%. So when we're in the gym, we're making like, like causing micro damage to the muscle. And what happens when we cause micro damage, the, your body goes, Oh wow, that wasn't strong enough, or that wasn't the, the tissue needs to be built back up bigger to handle those loads again. So that's what it is. We tear it down a little bit, and it just grows a little bit bigger than what it was. That's the whole point of going to the gym. So it's like in the gym, we're actually breaking it down. Then in our rest and recovery is when we're actually building that muscle. So that's where nutrition comes into one of our big rocks of recovery, and that a lot of that repair happens when you're sleeping as well. So as a rule for building muscle, you want to be having like however much you weigh, approximately like double that in the grams of protein. So I'm about like 90 kilos. So about 180 grams, give or take 10, 20 grams each side of that is a good range um, of protein to have every single day. Um, And you want to have that evenly across um, your meals. You don't want to just have 180 at dinner. You want to have that evenly across today because we're trying to spike something called muscle protein synthesis, which is just a form of where... um, where you're most likely to build muscle. Um, so going back to your question before, carbs are our fuel. So before we go into a um, a training session or a game, you want to be um, you want to have carbs in your system available to um, be turned into energy. So the closer you get to your training or game, you want to have um, higher GI carbs. So they're more your fast releasing carbohydrates. So they're more like your almost like your unhealthy stuff. That's so like you see lollies and things like that being given out at footy or oranges, things like that, things that are broken down really fast. So maybe a few hours before a game or a train, you have some like slower release carbs. So that's, that's just like your typical, like your pasta, rice, your wholemeal breads, your, your oats, etc. Then as you get closer to game, you want to have your more fast releasing carbs. That's where you might go to your, like your fruits. Sugar, yeah, fruits. Yeah, absolutely. Your sugary fruits. Um, yeah, yeah, your pretzels, your like your, your white breads with like honey or jam or um, yeah, like the, and want to be light on, light on, wouldn't it? Hundred percent, hundred percent. You want to feel good, so you don't want something that's going to sit in your guts. And yep. those stuff, the beauty of those, they digest really, really fast. So think slower, releasing big meals, and then as you get closer, um, 
but smaller but fast releasing like fruits and things like that close mm-hmm. to the game. So, that, so that's how you want to sort of want to fuel up. And then post that, um, you want to get some, you want to be having protein every three to four hours anyway. But chances are if, if you've been exercising for a couple of hours, you haven't had protein close to that beforehand anyway. So you want to get some protein in um, after you after you train. But the, there's no certain window that you need to get protein in. However, it is more optimal, as I sort of said at the start, to have protein evenly across your day. That's probably eating every three to four hours. And just by nature of that, they'll probably fall straight after a gym session or a, or a game of footy or something like that. Yep. So then are you looking to more... So how heavy are you going afterwards? So, uh, so let's say I would... I wouldn't be... It depends on what the meal is. Like, it's a lot easier to get... Is there a, sorry, is there a window like... That you shouldn't be eating, like say straight after. Should you let yourself settle first? Maybe I don't know. Like no, it's not really. It's no. That doesn't really matter as much the timing, um, for that matter. It's more just hitting your protein consistently ac- across the day. So if you're training, if you've if you're training late at night and you've already had big protein breakfast, big protein lunch, big protein um, dinner, and like some some pre protein a pre gym snack or something like that with protein in it, you probably don't need to have any more. Whereas if you're training first thing in the morning before breakfast, you want to probably have a big protein breakfast. You know what I mean? So that's just ticking off. You're going to eat four times throughout the day. Uh, make sure that you get got a good amount of protein in every single one of those meals. And then typically that would just sit in between a gym session, I'm sure. What's your take on um, fats first? I'll just touch on that. Um, total fats that you need to be taking. How important do you find that? Or you, do you try and steer away from the fats? Yeah, healthy fats are, are critical. Um just for your overall health and well-being. So um, I wouldn't like I wouldn't recommend like a high fat diet for athletes just because it's not as the fats take longer to break down and turn into energy than than carbs. So because carbs are our no, main like fuel source when it comes to exercise. So if you're going to be doing sport and playing cricket or playing footy, you're going to want to have um, carbs in your system over fats. And fats can often lead to you feeling heavy. Like you've got a big steak, you're feeling pretty heavy afterwards. So fats are absolutely great for uh, good healthy fats. are great for overall health and well-being, which is, which is what you need to have. But just try, try not to have them before um, you need to go exercise, is what I'd say to that. And why is it some people, obviously, see you, you're posting a lot of clips a lot lately, doing well on social media. But why do you see some people say um, influence or that, say um, carbs are the enemies. What, what is your take on that? And why do people mistake carbs as being the enemy? Uh, it's either it's either some people aren't educated at all on what they, and they, they have no idea what they're talking about, number one. Um, so they're either ignorant or they're lying to people. Yeah. Um, they're lying. They're, the cold hard facts would be they're lying to people on social media because com- comments without nuance get a lot of views. They get a lot of followers. And then they want to turn those followers into money. Yep. Um, if you break it down, that's probably the main reason why I do it. They're, they're trying to, to, to lie to you, to cause some sort of emotional response to make you follow them. And, and then they're going to put you into their ecosystem and then they're going to um, try and sell to you and try and get, make money. I think that's actually the, probably the simplest read, like when it boils down to it. Either that or they just don't understand how the human body works at all and they're... Um, yeah, a lot of the time the influencers online or in the fitness scene are just people who have like really good bodies, but they actually have no education at all to back it up. Yep. And people go, oh, they look like that, so I must listen to them. Mm-hmm. Whereas it's like they probably just have really, really good genetics or they just have try- found something that works for them, but they don't. They only have one experience, whereas an educated person can help many different people because they have the, the principles to go back on. Yeah. Um, to help people in a variety of different scenarios. So, yeah, it's either they're lying to, to make more money um, or they're just, just uneducated at all. Yeah, because I know there's a guy who goes to my gym. He runs a coaching um, platform with another person. And they always say, um, people sometimes say, oh, I'm eating all this, but I'm not putting on muscle. They always go, one, you're not eating enough. And two, you're eating the wrong shit. You need to be eating and f- um, filling yourself with the right stuff. Why you, you're wasting your time. Hundred percent. When it comes to like weight, like loss or gain, it it does come down to like calories in versus calories out at the end of the day. Like at a at a um, 
biological level. Um, there, where the nuance comes into that is that with the coaches, different strategies and and ways how you can get to that result. But in the day, it just comes down to that. You aren't either if you want to gain weight, you're not. You're not eating. You're putting enough energy in, and you're probably not putting enough protein as well to actually build that muscle up. Um, it is as simple as that. But then how you how you actually get to that is where the nuance comes in. Yep. Sugars. What do you take on sugars? So every um, like carbohydrates is sugar um, when it's broken down to. So when you break down like a carbohydrate, it breaks down to glycogen, which is sugar. Mm. Um, so when people say that, it's like sugar is carbohydrates. However, I think like added sugar and things like that, there's a time and a place. So go back to what I was sort of saying before is like your slow release um, carbohydrates are the ones that probably have like not much added sugar in it. They're, they're probably whole foods. Um with no added sugar. And that's, but when you want to have, you know, a fast spike in energy and you want to have that fast releasing food, you want to shoot foods that are more like sugary because it breaks down faster because it's, it's closer to that. Um, it's a simpler carbohydrate, so it breaks down faster into your energy. So um, for athletes, let's say if we're working for a high level cricketer, mm-hmm. um, before you go out and bowl or bat, absolutely get some sugar in you. Where, if you look at like the Australian healthy guidelines and things like that, it would be like an eat sometimes food or eat sometimes food or something like that. Um, that's for like just general people who aren't exercising much. And obviously you don't want to eat like high sugary, simple, fast releasing energy because that's where you get your energy spikes and, and things like that. It's not consistent energy. So for the everyday person, you probably want to stay away from added, you know, sugar food as like your main form of energy. Mm-hmm. But for high performing athletes who want to maximize their performance, um, critical. I feel like they have absolutely critical. And moving back to more the cricket stuff, what are some of the key aspects you think there is? If there was five, let's say five, let's list five things you need to do to be a a fast bowl. Because I know that's where you probably prioritize a lot. Um, being a fast bowl, what are the five things you're saying is the most important? Whether it be exercising, type of exercises, type of stretches, and all that type of stuff. Hundred percent. I reckon. With anything in life, having guidance and coaching is just crucial, whether it's business, whether it's sport, whatever. You can figure things out for yourself, but having, but you're often a little bit really, you're often too invested in your own self to not, to not have objectivity. So having, I think, a fast bowling coach who you can rely on for your um, action, tactics, um, game plans, etc. number one, crucial. You have that to bounce ideas off. Um, doing like having a strength and conditioning coach or following a strength and conditioning plan, number one, to make sure you can stay on the park. And then number two, you have all the physical tools to be able to um, bowl all day long and be fast enough to bowl fast. Um, fast bowlers need to be strong. They need to be fit. They need to be fast. Um, they need to be lean. Um, so you need to make sure you're following a plan that allows you to be that. So fast bowling coach, strength conditioning plan, smart one for that's specific to you. You need to be sprinting regularly. Um, sprinting is probably the most underrated thing of all time when it comes to um, fast bowling. So I'm going to say sprinting and doing it properly. Uh, from there, you've got to make sure you're eating well and you're fueling well and recovering well. We'll put that, like nailing your recovery is something as a, as a um, category in itself, so your sleep and your nutrition, hydration. Um, and then the last thing, and then we'll put mobility in the, into that one as well, so we'll cover off a few. Mm-hmm. And then the last thing there is that I feel like it's probably one underlooked, but it's, you always got to be reflecting and learning on your experiences. Um, that's what the best players do. They don't just... So you were pen and paper writing down what I necessary to learn or how I went that week? 100%. I'm, I'm all for that. I'm massive on that because... A lot of people can just go through the same session all the time and not actually like learn from it. Whereas the people who are constantly learning are the people that are constantly getting better. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I'm big on my athletes. So at the end of the day, when you're bowling, you're out there alone, like pretty much by yourself. Yes, you've got your captain and people to lean on. However, when you're at the top of your market, it's up, it's up to you to figure that out. And if you're not reflecting and learning and analyzing and 
from your experiences, then how are you going to actually get better day in, day out? So that they're probably the five big things for any fast bowler to, to, to nail. If you're nailing that, then 100% you're going to go a long way. Yep. Now you're doing some stuff with the Rocket Factory as well. Do you want to explain something? you got some new stuff coming up as well, or is that just recently started? You have done stuff prior, so what's that involved and how are you enjoying that? Yeah, um, the Rocket Factory, who's run by Simon O'Brien, doesn't get his face on the in front of the uh, the screen as much as what he should, I reckon. So he's a really, really good man. He's one of the best fast bowling coaches that I've um, seen and worked with. He's an absolute star um, based in Melbourne. Yeah, me and him, we work really close together. Not only is he just like one of the all-time best fellas going around, like he's a really, he's a great man. Um, he's also really, really smart. He's a gun fast bowling coach. So compliments really, really well. When my guys need fast bowling coaching, straight to him or other people in my network as well. Um, and then vice versa. If he gets fast bowlers that need to get, you know, fast, strong, powerful, fit, lean, um, he can send them to me. So it's a really, good, really good partnership that we have. And we are working on a couple of things. We have sold some, done some like programs together and, and some like recovery things and things like that. Mm-hmm. We're releasing something called the um, Academy. So the High Performance Cricket Academy is going to be called. And that's going to be like an educational based platform where we're going to be on there. Um, I'm going to take care of the strength conditioning side. We're going to get specialist coaches in for batting, fielding, weight keeping, etc. Who's going to take care of the fast bowling side. And we're just going to be posting educational content and where you can get that nuance with like Instagram and things like that. It's short clips. Um, you're trying to be a bit catchy and trying to, you know, catch up people's attention. You can't quite have that nuance. As you said, that touch on the, the carbs, the enemy, it's that black and white thing gets clicks. Yeah. On this, it's more about purely education to help cricketers have a better understanding on why they would do a certain training and to help them get better. And there's going to be like a community aspect to it as well where people can come in, they can ask questions, they can introduce themselves, they can talk to other cricketers and hopefully it just becomes a, a point where sitting five years down the track, we have all these gun coaches we're working with and people asking questions. We have people you know, collaborating together, solving their own problems and just helping people get better. And we're on there just posting a lot of content, um, creating some short courses and just helping people, helping the cricketer be a more educated version um, so they can you know, help train themselves. Because I think education is a massive part of my coaching, like actually giving, understanding why you're doing something so that then you can problem solve for yourself when I'm not there. Mm-hmm. And who is some of the um, people you're training that could be next up, you think? Mm, well, we got, uh, well, Riley Mark, he's just got state contracted. He's, okay. a, he's from Berwick. Um, he's got state contracted, rookie contract, playing for Richmond, um, spin bowler. So he's just got rookie contract. He eight for, didn't he, one game? Yeah, one? he had a great final series. He worked so hard. He, had really, he worked so hard. He, he came out of nowhere, I thought. Not out of nowhere, but like he just had this during... Close to finals, then finals, where he was just taking bags after bags. 100%, 100%. He's been, yeah, he's been in and around the market the last couple of years. He's been playing ones for years now. He's only like 21, I believe. Actually, he's 21, which was his 21st couple of weeks ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's been there, thereabouts, just playing, playing a really, really good role for Richmond the last couple of years. I've always rated his talent. Even before I started working with him, um, I thought he was pretty stiff not to get state contract the year before um, when others did. And to see him go through the year, bowl, bowl well just without the, the reward. And then I believe, yeah, week before finals, like four far, five far, four far, five far, eight far, or, yeah. so, or something like that. And it was, um, that was really, really, that was really, really cool to see. Um, I was really, really happy for him. And then, yeah, it sort of wasn't, I don't think the state contract before then wasn't really in the, um, in the picture. And then all of a sudden he's, he's picked one up after that, you know, performance and couldn't be any more well deserving. So, He's one that I'm like super proud of and just so happy to be a part of his journey. Um, another one of my guys, Kieran Elliott, he played for some games for Tassie last year as well. Um, so Kiz actually, he ended up getting a state contract at the end. He's a little bit older. I mm-hmm. um, believe he's might be 28, Kiz. But he's done it the hard way. He's gone through Premier Cricket. He's worked his tail off, works up into the ones at Melbourne. Had a really, really good season a couple of years ago. And then, yeah, was lucky enough to get his couple of first class games last year got Cam Green out for his first wicket and um got a got a state contract this year which is absolutely just like so awesome for him um and yeah I'm doing a bit of speed work uh with Brody Simons who played some second 11 cricket this uh, the last game this year um 
I work with uh, Mitch Rowe does his, his gym program. Gym program so big shout out to Mitchie Rowe, absolute legend as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm just going to speed stuff up Rhodes. He's on the move to Pooh Paran this year from Frankston. So pretty big signing there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, like, a couple of boys who I'll see in the off season, like Cam McClure has been in with me in the off season and Toddy Murphy being in the off season. So those boys are obviously going to be um, already state contract and Toddy's playing for Australia and Cam's um, not too far away, hopefully, after a big season with the Vicks. So, yeah, working with a lot of good, talented athletes at the moment and there's heaps as well who are coming through the junior Vic setups and that that I'm looking forward to um, helping, helping as well. I know Indy Noble in the female space I'm working with as well. She's really, really good. Played under 17s and Vic 19s last year. Um, Lucy Page, who was the Vic under 19s captain last year. So a couple of girls as well who I'll give them a massive shout out and hopefully um, they can kick on the big and better things this year and get themselves into some state squads as well. Yep, so we also have, uh, obviously, coming up very shortly, the uh, World Cup, the T20 World Cup. Now, obviously, I've got the squad here. Is there, you've seen the squad, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. There's one particular name that's missed out that I don't think anyone knows why. But um, is there anyone else that has missed out, you think? And let's break the ice. Why is Jake Fraser McGurk not in there? Oh, you've got to get the rooster in there. you just got to get him in there. How good has he been in the IPL too? Unbelievable. That man is playing. He's always been a rock star, but now he's playing like it. Because he struggled probably his first few years, didn't he? Oh, yeah. He's, um, he's had some ups and downs. I've known Jake for... Oh, Years now, back back in my back in our Richmond days, we played Richmond together. Um, he was playing. We played. I think played one one or two games together when he somehow got dropped down to the twos. But he's always been obviously a star mm-hmm. for for years. And he um went through. He was probably struggling a little bit in Victoria. First on the scene, obviously, couldn't really nail down his spot. Uh, but moving to South Australia last year, obviously, he's really probably forced him to settle down a little bit. And he's um in his life, and he's just figured things out and worked really, really hard. And obviously, he's always had the talent. Like, back in the day, geez, he would just smash balls everywhere. Like, so, this, gun. what we're seeing now, he's always done. Yeah, 100%. He's so, gun- I feel like he didn't do it probably when he first came in. I don't know if he was just a bit nervous, a bit timid, because he didn't want to come in and do that straight away. But this is what he was always doing in the lower ranks as well. Yeah, 100%. He's always, he's always tried to, to tee it up. And he's always been pretty aggressive. Not striking at 230 or something like that. Um but he's always been an aggressive player. He's always been unbelievably talented. He's always been confident in his ability, confident in his skills. I think he just needed some backing from um, from, from the coaches around him. I think he got a lot of backing in South Australia, which put a lot of confidence in him. Ricky Ponting's obviously coaching him really, really well. And he's finally um, showing off his talent. Like it, He's come a long way in the past year. I remember uh, this, time, I got, this time last year we were in Bali together and he's just lost his... Um, Big contract, and he's on the move to South Australia. And then one year later, he's um in the in the IPL. He's driving Ferraris with David Warner. So <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's unbelievable where, where you can be um a year later. Yeah, obviously you mentioned Bali. Now you love Bali, don't you? Yeah, we love it. What what um what are some stuff you can talk about over in Bali? What are some of your favourite spots or favourite memories over there? Yeah, so Bali is obviously is a, a great part of the world, nice and close and accessible. Um, because how. F- Far a trip um, plane ride is it about six? Yeah, it's about six hour six hour plane ride there. Um, on the way there, it goes pretty quick. On the way back, when you're in a red eye after ten solid days, it's pretty pretty tough on the body. Mm-hmm. But yeah, oh, it's absolutely we um me and my mates um joke about how much we love it. But no, nah, it's a good spot to go for a holiday end of season. Um, got to go Monday nights at, at Luigi's in Changu. Can't miss that Luigi's. Walk down the hill. When it shuts around about eleven or twelve into sandbar on the old man's into sandbar to kick on into the early mornings is a great one. Uh, Got to be at Surveyor Saturday night in Uluwatu, mm-hmm. one of the best establishments in the world. Quite expensive for a drink, but about oh twenty two, twenty four bucks for a, for a vodka Red Bull or a vodka Jesus. sort of soda. Pretty steep in Surveyor, but for the one night, it's worth it. Got to do it. Um, Motel Mexicola, La Favela, the Staples. Um, Fins went there last year with mates from Cooey. We had 20 people up in the VIP section of Fins, which is quite, quite a nice little place. Does so, it live up to the height, Fins? Yeah, I can. our day at Fins a couple of years ago, we were very lucky. We had about 20 or something people in Fins from, from Cooey up and surrounding areas. Um, just sort of happened to have everyone there at the same time and probably one of the best days of my life. It was such a good day, that. Yeah. 
And before we finish off, what are some, what's the future plans for you, obviously growing the business? What are some of the stuff that we can look forward to coming up? Yeah, 100%. I'm always looking um, at opportunities. I'm, how can, my, from my perspective, it's about how can I help as many people as possible? Um, and I like some goals for me would be to head over to India at some stage and um, do some coaching or just experience the IPL or things like that. So whether that's going with high performance cricket and getting um, going to like the, the academies and helping out there and doing some things there during this, this time period next year, you're after that or... I'd love a I'd love an IPL gig as an SNC coach. That'd be so cool. Yeah. Um. I'd love to get over to to America and do some stuff over there. And What's the, the cricket over there like at the moment? Because that's growing a bit, isn't it? Oh, it's gonna be really good. Mm-hmm. I think it's, I think it's gonna be proper. Um. One of my good mates, Brody Couch, he's playing over there. He's got a um like a, I think one of his parents is American or he's quarter American or something like that. So he's playing over there in the MLC. Yep. With I think I think Roos is playing over there. Jake Friends is playing over there as well. And um, I know the San Francisco teams, Crew Victoria backed, um, and the team that's ten, New South Wales backed. So they're doing it all proper. Ricky Ponty's coaching over there. I think it's going to be massive next couple of years. So I'd love to get over there at some stage and do that. I'd love to get over to, to UK as well and do some coaching over there. Same thing as well. Maybe go for a bit of a mini working holiday, a bit of Europe, a bit of coaching in England as well. So... I think a lot of, a bit of travel, get up to Sydney as well. I've got some clients up in Sydney that I want to help out. So I think for me, like solidifying my in-person coaching here in Melbourne, um, keeping the athletes I'm working with now. I've got a lot of guys I'm going to see I can work with over the next, you know, three to five years, hopefully, and hopefully get them to their goals. Um, and then my online guys as well, solidify them. And then, yeah, trying to go on certain um, trips overseas and trying to, meet a lot of people, experience different cultures and see where, as you know, cricket's a global game and I'd love to be able to travel overseas and help coach and, and things like that. And with the power of social media, um, I think anything's possible and that would be absolutely great. And whether it's getting um, coaches in to help me and trying to build um, out a team of high-performance cricket strength and conditioning and slash career coaches, that's probably the next phase as well that I really want to... Um, start to invest in and start to help other coaches, you know, develop their, their skills in cricket too. So big goals ahead, but if we can all come off, I think it's going to be really, really cool. And at the moment, I'm absolutely loving it, um, all the high-performance cricket things. And I think there's big big things in the future. I've only really started doing it for 18 months. So it's, um, yeah, hopefully the world's our oyster and we can just um, keep growing, expanding and helping more people. How can people get in contact with you? Uh, through Instagram, so highperformance.cricket is the place to go. Um, on TikTok as well, I think the same handle. Facebook, um, LinkedIn, YouTube as well. I'm starting up a YouTube channel at the mm-hmm. moment, um, which I'm going to hopefully try to get a video out every single week, some longer form content. Uh, that's kind of the, the main places to, to look at there. Um, yeah, feel free to message me if you need a hand with anything. Um, yeah, if you need to have a call and chat things through, always here to help. Well, it's been a pleasure, Coxie. Thanks for coming in today, mate. Awesome. Thanks very much, Trina.